Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar presented by New Frontier Data. Today we will be taking a look back on the last year in the cannabis industry and discussing the impact of 2016 on the future of the industry. My name is Gretchen Gailey, Vice President of Communications and Government Affairs at New Frontier Data and I'll be your moderator. Just a few quick housekeeping items. First, today's event is being recorded and will be made available to you after the webinar. We will send out an email to view the on-demand webinar as soon as it's available. Second, please enter your questions using the webinar's on-air control panel, which is located on your screen. You can start entering any questions you may have now. We will get to as many questions as we can at the end of our presentation. Now let's take a look at the agenda for today's event. First, we will tell you a little bit about New Frontier Data and jump into our 2016 year-end review. Then we will meet our other panelists and find out what 2016 event was most impactful for the sector of the industry. Then we'll take as many questions as time permits. We want to thank Leslie Boxor of Electrum Partners, Rob Campia of the Marijuana Policy Project, and Kayvon Kalapari of Denver Relief Consulting for being on our expert panel. We'll hear more from them after the presentation. Now, before we jump into the meat of our webinar today, we'd like to ask you a quick poll question. How concerned are you that the Trump administration will target the cannabis industry? A, not at all concerned. B, slightly concerned. C, somewhat concerned. D, very concerned. E, extremely concerned. Give you a few seconds to answer. You'll be able to answer throughout the presentation. If uh, the spirit hits you to change your answer, feel free. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, we will reveal the results after we hear from all of our speakers. And please remember, as we're going through the presentation, please send in any other questions you may have. Now let's jump into the findings with John Kagia, our Executive Vice President of Industry Analytics. John. Thank you very much, Gretchen, for that kind introduction. Um, for those of you who may not know us, New Frontier is a data analytics company that is focused exclusively on the legal cannabis industry. We aggregate data from a spectrum of sources, including federal and state government agencies, um, from businesses that are operating within the industry, um, from advocacy groups, from the medical community, to understand uh, the key developments trends, uh, uh, issues, and opportunities that are emerging as we transition from uh, an illicit market environment into an environment where cannabis is legal. As Gretchen said, uh, my name is John Kagia. I'm the EVP for Industry Analytics with New Frontier. And I lead the team that has been uh, conducting the research that New Frontier has been doing over the past uh, few years. And it is within that context that I'd like to take a few minutes uh, before we get into the Q&A with our panelists, um, to just present some of the most uh, compelling uh, illustrative findings that we've aggregated over the past year um, that highlight just the, the extraordinary developments um, that we have seen in legal cannabis uh, in 2016. To begin with, one of the questions that we get uh, very often is why cannabis seems to be moving at such an extraordinary pace in terms of uh, the, the number of new states that are legalizing, the change in, in public uh, opinion and perception, and, and the change in the way the public discussion around cannabis is taking place. Well, based on the most recent uh, research conducted by Quinnipiac University, public support now for medical legalization now sits at 
And the, the striking thing about that number is it holds consistent regardless of the um, political orientation, gender, education, and other socioeconomic factors. This is now a national consensus issue. Um, and uh, it is also one of the fastest evolving public issues uh, in American society today. Particularly worth noting is that Republicans who have generally taken a dour view of marijuana um, approve of medical marijuana at the rate of 81%. Um, which just further underscores the fact that, uh, at least on the medical side, um, this is largely now a settled issue. Support for adult use legalization uh, is, has also grown explosively over the past um, uh, a few decades. Gallup has been f tracking this issue since 1969, when only 12% of Americans uh, supported adult use legalization. And now, here we are two and a half generations later, and support is now at 60%. Both Gallup and Pew say that this issue, this support for, question on support for cannabis legalization, is the fastest changing public opinion issue that they are, that they are tracking. And it's particularly worth noting that support amongst millennials and Gen Zers is uh, higher than with any other age group, which means that um, because younger people support uh, legalization at far higher rates than older people, the momentum behind support for legalization is only going to continue to grow over time. In this past election, we had nine states vote on cannabis legalization initiatives. Five states, uh, Arizona, California, Maine, Massachusetts, and Nevada, voted on adult use initiatives and four, Arkansas, Florida, Montana, and North Dakota, voted on medical initiatives. We spent a lot of time talking to um, the smartest people in the industry in advance of this election. And I can tell you, um, I can't think of a single one who thought eight of the nine initiatives were going to pass. Um, to call this a seismic election result um, is not overstatement. The adult use initiatives in aggregate uh, the, the vote for them was at 52%. And on the medical side, uh, support for the medical initiatives was at 62%. A, a couple of points to, to note there. One is that support for uh, medical, as we have just seen, tends to be higher than support for adult use. Second is that um, these numbers could actually have been higher if the same coalition that uh, voted for Obama and his two election cycles had turned out in this election, uh, but we had a slightly different electoral makeup, um, which is why these numbers were slightly lower. And then third is, with Arizona being the only state which uh, did not pass its initiative, and it was still a relatively close vote at 47%, um, we see that you know, the, the, the um, election Despite going, um, uh, uh, despite the presidential election uh, being a, a, a result for the Republican Party, um, which has generally uh, uh, not been supportive of this issue, voters were splitting the ballot in terms of voting for Trump, but also voting for adult use legalization. Best exemplified by Florida, which um, voted for medical legalization at seventy-one percent. And. As a result of November's result, uh, election outcome, the national map now um, uh, just, it's an extraordinary shift in the national map in that it is now very difficult to find places in the country which do not have some type of law in the books. We now have uh, 29 states in the district which have medical, on the, uh, uh, medical use laws, eight states plus, plus the district uh, that have uh, adult use uh, laws. And um, if you look at uh, the two coasts, so adult use legalization began in Colorado and on the East Coast, but now the entire Pacific Coast has legalized adult use. But we've also established a beachhead for adult use legalization with Massachusetts and Maine. And um, based on discussions we are already hearing in places like Vermont, um, we expect that by having those two states on the East Coast uh, with adult use legalization, it's going to catalyze a much more robust debate um, in the Northeast uh, for further adult use legalization. So that's an issue that we're going to be uh, closely watching over the next um, couple of years. 
So what does this mean for the size and growth of the market? In 2016, uh, New Frontier partnered with RP Market Research to uh, produce project projections on the size of the legal cannabis industry. By our estimates, in 2016, the total legal cannabis industry is going to be valued at $7.9 billion, growing to $21.2 billion by 2020. This makes it one of the fastest growing industries in our economy. And it is worth noting that um, just the adult use section of the market, which is the catalyst for uh, much of the growth that we're going to be seeing um, over the coming years, um, the adult use component of the market alone is growing at a compound annual growth rate of 48%. Um, one, one final point to note here is that um, by 2020, the medical and adult use markets are going to be about the same size. Um, and and the, that's because even though there are fewer adult use markets, um, the explosive growth that we see in these adult use markets post-legalization uh, mean that they very quickly uh, ex and kind of exceed or envelop the, the medical markets uh, simply because there's a much larger consumer base on the adult use side of the market than there is on the medical side. It's also worth thinking about what impact the election has had on the market opportunity in the cannabis industry. Again, based on the um, uh, RQ market research and New Frontier market projections, by our estimate, just the, states that, just the eight states that legalized uh, in this November's election um, will uh, represent $7.4 billion in market sales by 2020. And between 2016 and 2020, the total value of just those eight states is going to be worth $16.3 billion. This is vitally important to think about because it, um, it shows how impactful the activation of every new market in this country uh, can be on catalyzing uh, significant market opportunities, investment opportunities, and social change opportunities um, uh, in, in the U.S. Um, and, you know, as we think about the fact that a market like Arizona uh, failed to pass, um, the, the, the fact that that was, could have been nearly a billion dollars uh, in, by 2020, the Arizona market could have been worth nearly a billion dollars by 2020, means that um, had uh, more advocates and businesses in the sector uh, invested in that legalization campaign, the return on that investment uh, would have been very, very substantial. So with that quick overview, um, I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes uh, reviewing some of the trends or issues that we're going to be focused on um, in, in 2017 um, before we open up the, the, the floor to the panelists to share their perspectives. The election of Donald Trump um, sent shockwaves through the industry. Um, and doubly so when he, he nominated uh, Senator Jeff Sessions to be his attorney general. The reason why Sessions' nomination has created so much concern within the industry is because he has historically taken a very, very dim view of cannabis. Um, and as recently as April of last year was saying, things including that, uh, uh, that good people do not smoke marijuana. He has been very critical of Obama's uh, hands-off policy towards states that have legalized cannabis use. He has suggested that um, the federal government should be much more proactive and aggressive in its enforcement of federal law, uh, and by that we mean prohibition, even in the states where it is legal. Um, and, and he has clearly wanted to send a message that uh, 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 marijuana legalization should not be taken lightly. Despite this concern, there are some limiting um, potential effects that might limit the Trump administration's desire to intervene in legal cannabis markets. First, as we discussed early in the presentation, is how high public support is. There's not a constituency in the country left that will support the dismantling of medical use. 
um, and with 90% support in the country, 89% support in the country, it is um, unlikely that uh, there's going to be the appetite in Congress or within the administration to go after uh, medical use states and to have you know grandmothers complaining that the Trump administration has uh, kept them from being able to get their medicine. Second is the issue of states' rights. Um, as a Republican administration and a Republican-led Congress, um, this issue of states' rights is one that's going to have the conservative wing of the, of the Republican Party are very concerned about federal intervention in these markets, and that's a debate that the party is unlikely going to want to have. And then third is Donald Trump got elected on a platform of making America great again through um, uh, e catalyzing economic activity. Will he want to, as a first order of business, go after one of the fast communities in the country, in, in the country right now? Um, so for these reasons, the public support, the states' rights debate, and the fact that cannabis is an enormous business opportunity, um, we think that there may be a leavening effect on even uh, 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 Trump as attorney general in how much they're going to want to um, uh, pursue uh, states where cannabis is legal. And make no mistake about it, the demand for legal cannabis is staggering. Um, just looking at what we have seen in Washington over the past um, uh, two and a half years, in the, in the second half of 2014, sales in Washington was 65 million. That grew to 194 million in uh, the first half of 15, 420 million in the second half of 15, 551 million by the first half of 2016. And uh, we're already at uh, uh, nearly 550 million um, with, with a few weeks left in 2016. These, these revenue figures uh, have continued to exceed expectation. The level of demand has continued to exceed um, expectations. And it suggests that as we make these tra this transition from illicit to legal, um, there, there's going to be a very significant opportunity um, to, to serve a public that is clearly very interested in um, these legal products. Um, and, and again, just uh, another indication of how much demand we are seeing. In Colorado, um, by the end of last year, we're still waiting on the 2016 numbers to be released, but by the end of last year alone, they sold 20,000 pounds of flour um, uh, in, in the legal cannabis market, which uh, <laughs> is um, uh, an, an extraordinary jump given that when the market first started in, in January 2014, um, it was literally one fifth of that at 4,000 pounds. And the market has continued to grow from strength to strength. One of the effects of the continued growth of the, of the market is that as production has increased, as the number of uh, growers in the market has increased, and as the size of those growers has grown. So for example, in Colorado, when the first market first activated, you know, 20,000 uh, 20, square foot cultivation facility was considered relatively large. Um, now we know of people who are looking at building facilities as large as 300, 400, 500,000 square feet. And there are discussions of, of building facilities in California um, uh, upwards of a million square feet. Um, the scaling up of this industry is resulting in um, greater efficiency on the operation side, greater economies of scale. And one of the byproducts of that is that it is having significant downward pressure on prices. As a consequence, in Washington, we have seen prices fall from um, over $40 a gram um, and that's the price of a single gram when the market first activated to now uh, just under $13, and the trend continues downward. Um, this downward price pressure is something that we expect to be, uh, continue to be acutely felt um, in the coming years as the industry continues to grow. With all of the production that is taking place in the industry, one of the issues that is becoming a growing concern is the prevalence of 
pesticides that are not approved for human consumption um, in, in cannabis. Indeed, cannabis is such a, a, has been such a lucrative product that um, particularly when we're dealing with just the illicit market, growers didn't have much of an incentive to uh, grow organic or, or to keep their products clean. They were really focused on trying to ensure that they could grow as much product and sell as much product as quickly as possible. In the legal regulated environment, this issue of the prevalence of pesticides and contaminants in, in um, uh, cannabis is a growing concern. And indeed, Steep Hill earlier this year released a study that found that if the product sold in, can in California, which is the largest cannabis market in the world, was tested to the same standard that product in Oregon is tested, 84% of that product would fail. That will have very significant implications on how growers are going to be operating in California in the coming years as the state tries to um, uh, introduce new regulations into the market as well as be um, introduced testing onto its retail products. And finally, for all of the discussion about the enormous economic opportunity presented by cannabis legalization, we cannot lose sight of the extraordinarily important social impact that legalization is having. The, the, the um, F, FBI recently released some data showing that uh, uh, um, over 600,000 people arrested for cannabis offenses in 2015, and 90% of those were uh, for possession alone. And just to illustrate what happens when you legalize cannabis, in Washington, D.C. alone, arrests have fallen 95% since 2011. And the number of people charged with possession has fallen from over 4,200 in 2011 to just 32 in 2015. That means that there are far few people who are getting um, the arrest records the, the, and the lifelong burden of having uh, these um, charges uh, or, or, or criminal record, including the inability to get student loans, live in public housing, get certain jobs. Um, and uh, and, and so we bring this up as a point that the, the importance of cannabis legalization is not just in the economic opportunity, but indeed in the catalytic effect it has on ensuring that our public policy um, uh, reflects uh, the, the outcomes that, um, or, or, or that minimizing the harms associated with cannabis prohibition that we've been experiencing over the past near century. All right, now thank you, John. Now to our panelists. First, we have Leslie Boxer, our investment expert. He is the president and founder of Electrum Partners based out of Las Vegas. Leslie? Thank you so much, Gretchen. It's a, it's a pleasure to be included in this. Uh, you know, my background is in corporate finance and investment banking. We, we created Electrum Partners to be a business advisory service to assist entrepreneurs in making the right decisions as they grow their business. We do a little bit of pro bono work, um, advising states and jurisdictions on their regulations, and we're going to be looking at the investing side of the business in the coming year. <clears throat> you know, my view on uh, what's happening is really the enormity of this is something that we don't see people uh, discussing as regards to the financial requirements here in Nevada and the, requ the requirements to build out the market. Here in Nevada, we passed a medical marijuana law when we had 5,000 patients. We now have 25,000. There were 60 approximately dispensary licenses given, about 100 uh, cultivation licenses, 100 extraction licenses in 10 labs. Over $400 million has been spent building out that infrastructure. Now, this year, as a result of action in 2015 and 2016, you see the states of Pennsylvania, Ohio, Louisiana, Maryland, Hawaii, um, Florida, Arkansas, Montana, and North Dakota, all with medical marijuana programs that are robust and need to be built out. The California regulations for the first time regulating their medical marijuana market are going to require tremendous investment. And then, of course, we have the adult markets of California, Nevada, Maine, Massachusetts that are going to need to be built out. When you start to look at the total amount of money that's going to need to be deployed on a national basis, it's a number that it goes um, higher than $20 billion around the country. 
All right. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, now we are going to go to Rob Campia, the Executive Director of Marijuana Policy Project. Rob is here to discuss all things policy related. Rob. Thanks, Gretchen. And uh, John, that was a really good job of uh, doing the national economic overview. Uh, MPP, uh, you know, we've been lobbying on the federal level since 1995. And so for 22 years, we've sort of had a low level uh, federal lobbying effort, which is about to escalate now that we finally have a real chance at um, making some serious uh, progress on the federal level, or at least the need to play defense. And as far as the state level goes, um, MPP was responsible for passing five of the eight uh, legalization laws. So we um, did Colorado, Alaska, and then this last election, it was Nevada, Massachusetts, and Maine. We assisted with California, but really there were other institutions that played a more serious role in California. And looking at this where we are currently, I think that the biggest developments, clearly California, that win is um, hugely important just because California is one eighth of the entire country by population. Uh, and then Nevada has an outsized um, uh, impact because with Nevada, um, while it is half the population of Massachusetts, it's massively more important than Massachusetts in terms of the number of tourists. And therefore Nevada will in fact be an exporter of legalization. Um, to the rest of the country. Um, Florida was significant, of course, as a huge medical marijuana win. And then finally, on the federal level, the um, Trump's election uh, in and of itself wasn't that important because Trump's position and Hillary Clinton's position were basically identical, uh, states' rights for marijuana. Um, but the, the big impact, of course, is that uh, Trump uh, uh, selected a, a nightmare scenario uh, with Sessions as the AG nominee, whereas Clinton would not have done that. And so we do have uh, a very a very big um, reason to be concerned and, and almost alarmed on the federal situation. And we all need to be focused uh, in the short term on making sure that the federal policies that we've worked so hard to implement don't unravel quickly um, when um, the president takes office on January 20th. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. And lastly, we have with us Kayvon Kalabari, one of the co-founders of the Denver Relief Consulting a Group to help address our cultivator and dispensary owner needs. Kayvon. Hey, thanks, Gretchen. I uh, appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I've been involved in the cannabis industry, drug policy reform for about 12 years now in Colorado. Uh, the first group I was involved with was actually a group called Safer that uh, Marijuana Policy Project and Rob uh, helped fund and implement out here. So uh, that was really kind of the birth of the modern movement. So back to John's comment about uh, what our what the social impact is around the cannabis industry progress that we're making. Um, I've experienced that firsthand and it's really uh, the main driver in what I do. So uh, we took that into our, to our vertically integrated dispensary here in Colorado, which we just sold in July to the Willie Nelson Group. Um, it was the oldest in Colorado at the time, about seven and a half years. Um, sold that so we could focus more on our consulting efforts, uh, which have, have really been successful across the country, earning top merit-based scores in Nevada, Maryland, uh, Illinois, Puerto Rico, uh, second highest in Florida. Uh, a lot of it built around that narrative of social progress around the cannabis industry. Uh, most recently, after that sale, got involved in the social use initiative here in Denver that passed Initiative 300, uh, which made Denver really the first city uh, along with uh, states like Alaska, California, and Nevada this year, um, legalizing social consumption looks like Denver will actually be the first major city to implement that. Um, and uh, I'm really excited uh, to be the lead proponent on that initiative, to have our office lead it. I think Denver and Colorado has done a really great draw, uh, job at setting the foundation uh, for the cannabis conversation, engaging all stakeholders, and really ensuring that we're considerate of really all the perspectives under the sun uh, with implementing this for the first time, hopefully learning some great lessons and passing those on to folks that come after us. Uh, um, Rob, Rob, do you, you want to talk, I'm sorry, sorry Kayvon, Kayvon, do you want to talk more about Prop 300? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, Alaska actually legalized last year. They've had a little trouble uh, getting social use off the ground. It's a very restricted system. Uh, that that's only a, an adjacent to dispensaries. Um, California, Nevada, Massachusetts, I believe all had social consumption components of their recreational initiatives coming up. So uh, this is truly a problem uh, that's not going away. We've, it's a problem we've experienced here in Colorado uh, with 
uh, 77 million tourists coming to our state every year, a lot of them undoubtedly coming for cannabis and recreational use. They can purchase and possess it, but they have no place to consume it. Uh, hotels generally don't allow for that use. Uh, even residents, we have uh, folks that live in HOA or landlord controlled properties uh, that are unable to consume inside. Uh, veterans that live in federally funded housing, and simply people that don't wish to consume cannabis uh, in their home uh, by their children or by their grandparents or other folks that they choose to keep it away from. So uh, the intent of the initiative was really back to Safer's message 12 years ago, um, give people the opportunity to enjoy the safer alternative to alcohol uh, and, and to enjoy it in a, in a similar capacity, so in that social setting. Uh, so what this has done, understanding it's very uh, a very new topic, uh, we, we've uh, created a, a way to step into this slowly by having permits instead of licenses. So uh, we have the opportunity to have a one hour permit or a two hour, a one night, a one day, uh, one week, one month. Um, but we also require that the neighborhood organization that overlaps with that uh, property uh, provide a level of support uh, to that uh, to that permit holder, uh, prospective permit holder before they apply with the city. And that neighborhood organization can create certain restrictions on that permit uh, that make sure the, the, it's really considerate of the, the, the differences that each of these neighborhoods have, considerate of their uh, residences, the businesses, and then to do so in a manner that allows us, again, to slowly step into this until we develop best practices around what social cannabis use looks like. Uh, even in places like Amsterdam uh, or uh, Italy, uh, there's social consumption, but it's tolerated. It's not regulated. Um, this is really the America's uh, tackling this topic for the first time uh, for anybody around the world. So really excited uh, to see what we can do that. But back to the social use, uh, right now we have a lot of people that are out on sidewalks, that are in parks, uh, that are essentially using cannabis where they shouldn't uh, because they have no other option. And, and on the social topic of this, uh, black people in uh, Colorado and Denver are still arrested at a rate 2.6 times out of white. So we have Denver being this uh, extremely progressive city with regard to cannabis, uh, still disproportionately affecting people of color um, for something that is legal. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why we did this. And uh, I think that we've, we've established a, a way of doing this, of ruling this out, that again, it's considered of all stakeholders. We had an initiative on the ballot last year, actually, that we pulled because the city wanted to have a seat at the table in constructing this thing. Uh, so we said, okay, we'll pull it, but we want the, the city council to address this topic. Um, when the when the time comes to open that session in the spring, and they didn't. They actually put more pressure on the cannabis industry for some things that uh, really weren't the cannabis industry's fault, but we often get thrown under the bus for these things and, and have to be the bigger people and overcome that. Uh, so we threw it back on the ballot this year, uh, and, and we won. So uh, right now we're in rulemaking. Uh, we're going to be on a committee within the uh, the mayor's office that's going to help with this uh, rule uh, creation and implementation with excise and licenses. And it sounds like uh, we're going to have applications at it the end of January, but unfortunately they're not going to accept them until the rules are done, uh, which may be a few more months after that. So I think that it's very possible that we may have social consumption designated areas. This could be in any business type, um, potentially bars as well. Uh, there was a liquor enforcement division uh, rule change uh, that they just uh, enforced this month or pushed through this month uh, that would disallow cannabis consumption on liquor license premises. Uh, but we think we did. they did that in a manner that was uh, outside of their authority and did not follow due process. So we'll be challenging that. Um, but theoretically, these consumption areas uh, would exist in any business type uh, in accordance with the Colorado Clean Under Air Act. So no smoking inside, vaporization edibles inside, uh, consumption outdoors and covered patios, rooftop decks, uh, things of that nature. And uh, ultimately, if this is a huge failure, uh, failure, which I don't believe is going to be the case, um, this uh, is a pilot program that will sunset in 2020 if it's not extended by city council or voter initiative. And as someone who helped build the industry here in Colorado, um, I was surprised we didn't get more industry support on this, understanding that California, Nevada, Massachusetts have these social consumption components to their initiative because this is getting very competitive on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, as, as Rob mentioned, um, you know, California is, uh, is, is massive. It's a behemoth um, compared to any other state in the country with regard to cannabis consumption. So they already have a leg up in that regard. I think places like Denver and Colorado and, and other states that want to stay competitive need to really look at the policy side of things and continue pushing for further in, in, in cannabis policy reform. Uh, just, uh, a just a quick question, question. Uh, uh, When do you when see the, the first, first opening, opening for social, social consumption? consumption? 
Uh, if I had to, you know, understand the city is going to be really delayed in this rulemaking process, they're uh, they're doing what they can to drag their feet um, within the bounds of their authority. Um, but it looks like we could expect the first permits being issued potentially next June or July. Hmm, interesting. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for those insights. And uh, now we are going to go to our poll question results. Um, how concerned are you with that the Trump administration will target the cannabis industry? Uh, number one answer was somewhat concerned, uh, followed up by very concerned, uh, and then coming in third, but not too far in third, uh, slightly concerned. Uh, so it seems everyone has a bit of concern about uh, the Trump administration coming up. Um, and since that is the burning question on everyone's minds, uh, we'd like to start today's conversation with all of our panelists addressing how they think a Trump administration will affect their particular sector of cannabis. Um, Leslie, why don't we uh, begin with you? How do you see this affecting the uh, investment world? You know, um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. My apologies for that before. Uh, I actually um, have, an, uh, my perspective is that the Trump administration is going to, for the next four years, keep any of the large players from coming into the industry. It's going to keep banking from becoming normalized and essentially create an opportunity for the smaller operators to continue to grow their business without worrying about the InBevs, the Altrias, the CVSs, the Pfizers and such coming into the industry and competing with uh, uh, with their wallet and crushing them with their economic power. So in many ways, this is going to end up being a positive in slowing the growth of the industry, especially after such a um, critical event and inflection point that we saw on this past uh, election day. So overall, I'd say that I'm positive on it, especially for the small operators. Okay. Rob, on the policy side, what do you think? Uh, I think that we have... Uh, reason to be uh, very concerned about um, the Trump administration, but I want to put it in context. Um, the president and the attorney general have not that much to do with marijuana policy nationwide. When you think about the power of the presidency, it seems like it's a, a, a you know an infinitely powerful position, and maybe Trump would like it to be that way. But in fact, um, the power of the presidency um, is um, very much. Uh, it resides with foreign policy and treaties and ambassadorships and um, and war, uh, but when you talk about marijuana businesses, um, really almost all the action is with state uh, and local governments. So, in terms of thinking about what is the president and the attorney general going to do, uh, really it comes down to sort of like this very narrow sliver of is this Cole memo, which is an advisory memo for the prosecutorial priorities for the federal prosecutors. What does that uh, memo look like in the future? It's advisory, it's not even law. Um, so that's one thing to pay attention to. And then the other is, um, you know, what, what is in fact um, the posture going to be with regard to um, uh, sort of demanding that Congress take action or not take action on various federal policies with regard to marijuana? I seriously doubt that marijuana is going to be a priority one way or the other for um, Jeff Sessions, or whoever ends up being the AG, and he's 99% likely to be the Attorney General. I seriously doubt it's going to be the number one or two or three priority, but to the extent that uh, marijuana policy is uh, contemplated by the Justice Department, it's probably going to go in the, the wrong direction for us as a, as a movement as well as, as an industry. Um, but that said, uh, to the extent that you want to focus on something on the federal level, it's much more important that you focus on Congress rather than the White House or the Attorney General. Most of the action is with Congress and all of those amendments. You hear about the marijuana amendments, the banking amendment, the veterans amendment, the Rohrbach Far amendment, the McClintock policy amendment. Anytime you hear about a marijuana amendment, that's actually congressional action and the, and the president has very little, if anything, to say about that. So I think you should be thinking about you know, 98% uh, of the action is actually with Congress and not with the executive branch. Okay. And Kayvon, how do you see this affecting uh, operators? Uh, you know, I, I got to agree with uh, uh, with Rob and Leslie on a lot of this. I, and I think there's going to be a lot of noise um, that has nothing to do with cannabis that this administration is going to have to deal with. And I really don't see cannabis being that high up on the pecking order, uh, at least on the front end of this administration and something they're going to tackle. 
Um, but even if it is, you know, back to Rob's point on, uh, you know, this industry needs to 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 understand to act as any other industry does to protect itself and to be a part of that federal discussion, that lobbying effort uh, that can really be done, I think, best through the National Cannabis Industry Association. Uh, for folks that aren't members of that, I encourage it. We do lobby days every year. Um, as an operator, that's been really tremendous for me to share my experiences with um, P uh, members of the House and Senate uh, directly with their offices, um, to put a face to it, um, to show them that we probably Probably buck the trend of what their perception uh, of us is, um, but uh, you know, ultimately, I, I personally maybe it's ignorance, um, but I feel uh, rather optimistic. Actually, um, I think that um, as much as we need to continue pushing and hammering on this lobbying effort and coming together as an industry and and working in unison, um, I just feel that there's too much that they're going to have to deal with as an administration to to really focus on cannabis. I, I hope that that's the case, anyways. Um, but I go back to Leslie's point. I, I entirely agree about this being a huge opportunity, especially for small business operators. Uh, as someone that started Denver Relief with four thousand dollars and half a penny cannabis eight years ago, those opportunities don't exist anymore, and nobody's going to have. Uh, that opportunity again because of the requirements to get into these licenses, especially in medical states where we have uh, limited licensing structures that have uh, very high barriers to entry. Um, I don't think we're going to see that change, but I think this really does help cement the opportunity for folks that are willing to take a little bit more risk um, and play with that um, uh, that other bigger companies wouldn't. I think that that playground is still there for the next four years. And I think that's rather exciting. That That's the reason uh, the federal illegality of cannabis is the reason uh, it's grown in the manner that it has uh, thus far engaging so many entrepreneurs and small business owners. And if it was a Schedule two, three, or 4 drug a couple of years ago, this industry would have a lot different look to it. So I'm actually cautiously optimistic and, and rather excited as an operator uh, in multiple states to see what kind of progress we can continue to make on the state level, um, but also on the federal level with uh, ensuring that they, they there's a buffer there uh, in between federal enforcement and what we're trying to get done in these states. Okay, thank you, Kayvon. Uh, just a quick reminder to our attendees, uh, please don't forget to submit your questions for our panel of experts, and we will provide today's slides to every attendee when we are sending out our recording later. Uh, now on to some of your un-Trump related questions. Um, looking at um, a couple here, Leslie, it appears that we have some excitement here on the East Coast uh, now with the passage of Massachusetts and Maine. Um, and folks are asking, what are the best businesses to invest time and money in? Uh, does it differ here on the East Coast? It does differ on the East Coast in some regards, but there's really a blanket answer to that, and that is very due diligence based and has to do with you, you know, knowing your own temperament as an investor. Uh, the, uh, of course, there's the old saw, the picks and shovels are what you want to invest in. And so all of the businesses that will be doing well around this industry, such as real estate, such as uh, capital equipment, uh, and agricultural equipment will be doing extremely well and there'll be a demand for it. Real estate prices will go up. You'll start to see uh, consulting businesses and attorneys doing very well. Uh, overall, though, I would say the difference as regards adult use on the East Coast and the rest of the country is minimal and the basic tenets of investing where you need to understand, do you want to invest in private companies or public companies? Do you want to be diverse in a number of different enterprises or focused on certain areas? Do you want to be an operator and get in and roll your sleeves up and be involved in somehow in the industry somehow? Or would you rather be more passive and just place your bets around the industry and, and, and use your due diligence to make your choices and hope to see your returns come from that are what you really need to be focused on. Overall, we're going to see normalization over the next few years where there won't be a difference from state to state. There won't be a difference from market to market. But now, Every single market is marketedly, markedly different from the others, not so much develop, determined by East Coast versus West Coast as it was a year or two ago when the East Coast was much more focused on extremely strict regulation, lim very limited licenses like we've seen in New Jersey, in Massachusetts, uh, well, not Massachusetts, New York, um, Delaware, Rhode Island, and more. We're going to see that start to open up more, especially as a result of what happened in Maine and Massachusetts this year. Okay, thank you, Leslie. Um, the next question we have here is for Rob. 
Are there any prospective adult use initiatives planned for Arizona's 2018 election? Well, I was actually just discussing that um, yesterday, and I think the, the answer for Arizona is that it's unlikely that we would try 2018, uh, and instead we're excited about 2020 in Arizona. Um, the election was a little bit closer than even John's presentation indicated because the votes kept coming in after election day. Arizona's uh, votes actually are counted 10 days uh, after election day. And so we actually got 48.7% of the vote, which might sound kind of better, but in fact, it just makes the loss more painful to me personally. Um, so we came actually super close. It was less than 70,000 votes uh, from winning. I think 2020 is uh, highly likely for success. 2018 is extremely difficult, not only from a fundraising perspective, but because the voter, the electorate is going to be more conservative in a midterm election than in a presidential election. And so I don't think we'd want to sign up for that. As a side note, I will say that the most likely state to vote on adult use in November of 2018 is uh, probably going to be Michigan. And I am going to Michigan tomorrow to investigate that situation. OK. Um, the next question we have here is for John. Uh, how will medical cannabis ultimately be different than pharmaceutical cannabis? Although the current development models in these two spaces are currently different, will there ultimately be a merging of these efforts? Great question, and, and a very complex one. Um, there are two parallel tracks currently happening in the medical space. Um, one is that takes a whole plant extract-based approach to uh, cannabis for therapeutic purposes. And so that's the form of medical cannabis as it's seen currently at the state level where um, you're getting flower oils and consuming that uh, to, to alleviate or treat specific conditions. And then the other is uh, what we're calling the pharmaceuticalization of the industry where you're uh, disaggregating the cannabis uh, plant into individual compounds and then developing therapies based on those individual compounds rather than the whole plant extract. And that's what uh, the, the kind of pharmaceutical industry is, is currently focused on, um, and, and that's kind of taking a much more research, scientific uh, uh, drug development process to, to the development of those therapies. Uh, um, question, John. This is Leslie. Could I say something to that? Please. Of course. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of people are very concerned with medical marijuana license, especially so many states that have medical marijuana programs and expanding them. At Electrum, we believe that the medical marijuana licenses, as we currently know them, will essentially become valueless after the drop of federal prohibition, which, you know, may be as early as five, seven years out if we're fortunate. Uh, why is that? Well, at such time as there is a drop of federal prohibition and cannabis becomes legal on a federal basis, uh, you will see people that will use it like a nutraceutical or supplement, the way that people go out and get red yeast rice or fish oil or other vitamins, melatonin, etc., that can even be functional. Uh, we will see what John points to, which is the development of drugs that go through the traditional pharmacological um, uh, path to be approved for efficacy and be able to make claims. Additionally, we believe that the FDA may look at an alternative path for cannabis drug approval similar to the whole plant botanical that they created in 20, 2005 and then uh, expanded and clarified in 2015 that there may end up being a path specifically for cannabis related therapies at some point in the future. As a result at that time when you'll be able to go to any corner shop and, and buy cannabis in states that have gone with federal uh, legality, uh, there won't be a need to get a medical marijuana recommendation in the same way that you don't need to go get a fish oil recommendation from your doctor to go buy fish oil. You'll just go to the uh, local shop that is available and make a purchase. And so at that point, the licenses that exist to allow stores specifically for medical marijuana will very much in not have the same value. They won't have the same presence because you'll either see drugs that can make claims based upon traditional clinical trials, or you'll see it available like any other uh, a nutraceutical uh, through a, a regulated and controlled market. That's an outstanding point, Leslie. And, and maybe the only thing I would add on to that is along that same time frame, the five to seven year time frame, we also expect to see 
um, the release of many new novel applications for cannabis um, at the pharma uh, as a pharma uh, pharmaceutical solution. So we, we have barely scratched the surface of um, the universe of cannabis research. We, we've barely scratched the surface of the spectrum of ways in which cannabis can be used um, to treat, alleviate, um, or, or, or uh, cure a spectrum of conditions. Uh, that research is um, is gaining a lot more traction. There's a lot more interest in funding that kind of research and doing that that kind of research. Um, but this stuff takes time and it's and then it's expensive to do. So um, watch for this confluence, as Leslie had said, between um, a shift in federal policy as well as uh, uh, the market release of these um, um, cannabis-derived therapies um, to really um, have a, a very significant transformative effect on the structure of the cannabis market as we currently know it. All right. Uh, moving on, uh, we have a question here for Kayvon. Uh, with the influx of big money into an increased corporatization of the cannabis industry, what are some ways to create differentiators uh, to set yourself apart from other competitors without breaking your bank? Yeah, I think that this is something a lot of industries are thinking about and going through. <clears throat> uh, I, you know, especially with someone like Trump getting into presidency, it's uh, pretty easy to see that you know big business is as strong as ever in this country, and I think that you know creating a, a local brand, uh, creating a brand that's considerate of our environment, of our community, uh, of uh, organic inputs, of all the things that people really seem to uh, start caring about, uh, about their food, uh, about um, wellness in general, uh, about the about where they shop and buy the buy the things that they wear and put in their homes. Um, I think there's a there's there's got to be a um, not just a branding shift in the cannabis industry, but uh, how we just how we operate and and be proud uh, proud proud of our uh, local nature um, to to implement environmental stewardship considerations that actually maybe do cost a little money on the front end, but save you in the long run, especially for small operators. That's something that's imperative um, that they start to look at ways to reduce energy consumption, uh, to to reduce those the cost of goods sold associated with producing cannabis, because these large operators um, in the consolidated cannabis industry, which has happened in Colorado, which will happen uh, in California, Washington, and Oregon, um, small operators need to get ahead of that and start to consider ways that they can decrease that cost that generally involves, um, you know, if you're not outside already moving into greenhouses or outdoors, um, looking at uh, ways to recycle uh, water, looking at uh, more innovative and progressive lighting technologies, mechanical systems, uh, things of that nature. Um, but really getting back to the perception of the cannabis industry, Denver Leaf as a small business really thrived and, and came across a lot larger than we actually were uh, because of our engagement with our community, uh, because our, of our engagement with our civic uh, leaders, the people that are implementing and regulating us, uh, implementing these rules and regulating us um, to, to think outside the box with regard to progress in uh, social considerations regarding minority and underserved inclusion, um, getting into, you know, discussing uh, some simple affiliations with uh, with doctors, with research professionals, we're running R and D projects in your facility. All of these things on the surface maybe don't seem to. Uh, you can't quantify a value on the bottom line of your business in, but I think they create the perception that you're in this for the right reasons. And I truly believe that, especially people that purchase cannabis, that uh, that care about the cannabis industry and the plant. Uh, the progress that we're making, I think they're going to attach themselves to those businesses, be more loyal to those businesses. And just as we have with uh, the craft brew explosion that we're seeing in Colorado and on the West Coast, um, really using that as a, again, that, that differentiator, people are willing to pay more, I think, um, for those companies that are a little more progressive and, and really doing it the right way. Okay. Um, our next question uh, probably could be answered by a couple of you, but I'm going to start with Leslie. Um, do you see investor interest in the Canatech sector? Um, what role do you see tech playing in cannabis? We're seeing an increasing, de increasing development of technology in the industry. It's really being split between a number of different areas. There's a lot of agricultural technology that's being developed, and that is in a number of areas, sensor, te sensor technology, cultivation management technology, optimization technology to produce better results from the existing indoor and automated greenhouse environments that are being deployed. Uh, as well, security technologies are being developed as we see tracking 
um, of the plant and chain of custody now not only existing from seed to sale, but also from seed to sale, including delivery. And that is one of the areas where we're starting to see some uh, new developments. Uh, for example, in Pennsylvania, one of the big battles currently is they don't have a mechanism for delivery, and yet they do have software that the state uses for uh, tracking, for example, uh, patients in elder care to make sure no one ever gets lost. And there, we're currently working with the state to see if they can't take those existing technologies that are already approved by the state and then allow them to work on uh, making delivery possible. So the answer is we are seeing a lot of technology, particular, particularly in the area of cultivation and getting greater efficiencies out of the existing environments. Kay Bon, how do you see uh, operators utilizing tech? Uh, well, going back to the comment on price, I think that's increasingly uh, going to be an increasing part of the conversation. I, I look at a you know, Livewell, for instance, here in Colorado, or Native Group. They're, they're some of the largest operators in the state. Uh, Livewell had a 100,000 square foot inter interior warehouse, uh, traditional warehouse, uh, that you can only really drop your costs of goods uh, down so far to really compete on price. So uh, they've moved themselves into a greenhouse environment. Uh, they, I believe, have done a similar test that we did at Denver Leaf with the uh, LEDs like Phantom and BIOS LEDs, which uh, you're looking at a 30 to 40 percent reduction on on input and load. Uh, therefore, a 30 to 40 percent reduction in cooling load necessary. Um, but also, uh, uh, Leslie mentioned getting into automating it, and I think we're going to see a lot of folks rely. Um, on automation as much as they can throughout the process, just as any other agricultural or, or botanical extraction or product manufacturing industry would. Uh, we're gonna see uh, more of the, the environmental control, uh, the, the irrigation, uh, just the, the daily maintenance of these plants um, be uh, put on automated systems, whereas we're going to have employees probably uh, be deferred to more of a, a role of a, 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 an advisory role, um, watching, supervising, making sure that these uh, systems are operating uh, as intended, um, but then also into post-harvest. Um, you know, hand trim is uh, something that I think a lot of people still hang on to a great deal, uh, mostly because most automated options weren't appropriate and really uh, damaged the flower. We're seeing a lot of improvement uh, in that. And, you know, instead of having 15 trimmers there for two days, uh, 12 hours a day to take down a room, they now have three people manning an automated machine for eight hours. Um, so it's really, uh, I think we're going to see a lot, we're going to see labor uh, diminish a little bit uh, per, I would say, pound produced in the cannabis industry. Um, but I also I also see it being something that we can use as operators as we expand to, to watch our operations, uh, you know, to be able to view what's going on, to be able to collect data and to analyze it appropriately, to be able to make uh, progressive decisions based on how we're operating, uh, based on this data, I think is really important. That's, you know, with what New Frontier is doing, uh, with, with a couple other organizations that are trying to get into the data sector. And that's, that's really one of the biggest uh, pieces of this industry that I think hasn't got a lot of attention so far. Um, but as we professionalize and really um, bring on more states, more professionalism, more money into this industry, that's going to become one of the most valuable things. So just being able to look at our data uh, that we've collected and put it to good use, I think is something that operators are really going to dig into here in the next couple of years. Okay, um, our next question here goes to Rob. Um, has there been any progress in addressing the banking issues? Uh, on banking, uh, almost everyone who's in the in the no in DC would say that we actually have the votes to pass the one year banking fix in Congress. Um, and so what that would mean is there'd be a one year um, ban on the treasury department spending resources to screw around with banks, just like uh, there's the one year ban on the justice department uh, screwing around with, um, with state medical marijuana laws. So there is the ability to pass uh, one-year fix in Congress and attach that amendment to the Treasury spending bill. However, um, there's not regular order with regard to um, passing those federal annual spending bills and the amendments that are normally attached to them. So if we are allowed to the fair opportunity um, to play the game the way it's usually played year to year, then I think you'd have that one-year fix. Uh, however, that said, that's the congressional angle. And we also have to remember that there's the Cole memo 
And when people talk about the Cole memo that the Justice Department uh, has in place, there's also a parallel uh, memo that's for um, the Treasury Department and, and banking. So there's really two Cole memos, if you will, one for the DEA and one for the, the banks. Uh, and the question of that pair, those pair of memos, that's purely a, a question for um, uh, Jeff Sessions or whoever the Attorney General is um, to figure out sometime this spring. Okay, we have time for one last question. Uh, we're going to make this a rapid fire question for all of our panelists. Uh, what is the number one issue you believe needs to be addressed in 2017? Uh, Leslie, you first. Could you say that again, Gretchen? What is the well. uh, top issue uh, that you would like to see addressed in the industry in 2017? That's easy. The top issue I'd like to see addressed in 2017 is self-regulation. Um, when the alcohol industry uh, experienced the drop of federal prohibition within a year, they had established self-regulatory efforts to deal with packaging, purity, potency, uh, uh, advertising, marketing, and such, uh, to deal with um, uh, drunk driving and more. Um, to deal with youth use. And we as an industry have been sorely lacking in establishing self-regulatory entities that work on a local and national basis to avoid the issues we see coming from laws like we're passed in Colorado, making edibles that are in the shape of an animal, a human, or uh, um, a fruit illegal. And the reason why that's so important is, although that sounds funny because you can make jokes about, well, if it's orange in color and orange in flavor and circular and doesn't have a stem or a leaf, is it still a fruit? The answer is when you start to deal with states that come up with regulations to deal with issues that the industry should be addressing, their ability to create good regulation that can be applied fairly is not going to be very good. And it's going to be terrible for the operators to deal with when the states seek to use these regulations without a knowledge of how to make them work effectively. And so the industry must come together in the coming years to establish self-regulatory agencies that can make sure that the actors in the industry are all staying in line and operating to high standards. If we don't, we're gonna find ourselves on the wrong end of a lot of poorly created state and federal laws eventually. Okay, Rob? Uh, politically speaking, I'd say that passing uh, a particular amendment in Congress is the most important. It's the McClintock Policy Amendment. So it's Tom McClintock, who's a Republican from California, and Jared Paulus, a Democrat from uh, north of Denver. And uh, that amendment would tie the hands of the Justice Department uh, with interfering with all state marijuana laws, not just medical marijuana laws. Passing that amendment, which we actually are close to doing, should be the number one concern that unites everyone across the country because it's a federal amendment that affects uh, all, all states with any kind of marijuana laws. I will say that I don't actually think that the industry is ready for the challenge. I've found that a lot of folks aren't serious yet about doing what it takes to uh, rein in the Justice Department or to pass any kind of amendment in Congress. And so I'm deeply pessimistic that this industry is mature enough to actually fund a serious lobbying effort that would actually be the ultimate victory uh, that we could score in 2017, which is to pass one amendment to the Justice Department spending bill. Okay, and Kayvon. Uh, it really ties in to both of those. I think the, the, the one thing that I wanna see the industry do is come together and have a unison voice, uh, whether it's um, on the federal level or the state level, uh, this industry is very fractured. Uh, it has a lot of different uh, ideas about how we should operate, how we should move forward. In Colorado, we have three industry groups that don't get along, uh, that don't work in unison. It's very difficult to get anything proactive done in the state because of that. I've, we've not been a member of the industry groups because of that, because we didn't want to align with one. Hoping that that can change this year, that we're going to have one Colorado industry group come together, uh, but then on the federal level, NCIA, people becoming a member of that, understanding what needs to get done, uh, what people like Rob are doing on the federal level to understand that process, to be a part of it, to fund it, to be active in it. Uh, we need to act like an industry, uh, to be treated like one, and 
one thing that I'm really disappointed in the, the cannabis industry about is this, this thought that they, that we need to protect our intellectual property or something that we think we're doing. That's so fricking special. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but everything that everybody's doing in the cannabis industry today is going to look sophomore 12 months from now. Um, so get that out of your head that, that what you're doing is special and collaborate, work together and let's build a strong industry together. Okay. And John final word. Mine is less an issue to be addressed and more just something to watch for in 2017. By and large, the public has been totally focused on the outcome of the presidential election. And most people are still not aware or, or focused on the fact that cannabis is now fully legal in Boston, in Las Vegas, in Los Angeles, in, um, in San Francisco. And that starting next year, Canada is going to legalize at the federal level. We've seen just in the past few weeks debates about legalization of medical in Ireland, in South Africa. Um, the, the pace with which this global debate is about to happen um, will be dizzying. And um, it is going to change significantly both the way the policy orientation looks, um, the way governments are thinking about this issue, and fundamentally the way um, we think about the role of cannabis in our society. Um, 2017 will be a catalytic year for this industry, um, and we're very excited to see how this plays out um, over the next 12 months. All right. Well, thank you, John. Uh, we are out of time. I'd like to thank all our attendees for their questions and thank our esteemed panel, uh, Leslie Boxor of uh, Lectrum Partners, Kayvon Kalabari of Denver Relief Consulting, and Rob Campia of the Marijuana Policy Project. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about these groups, please uh, take down their websites here and visit them. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. As mentioned, a recording and the slides will be sent out to you later this week. Have a great day.